You've tuned in to the Puritan and Reformed audiobook podcast. Today's reading is from section 3 of John Owen's Grace and Duty of Being Spiritually Minded, starting with chapter 11. The seat of spiritual mindedness is in the affections, the nature and use of them, the ways and means used by God himself to call the affections of men from the world. In the account given at the entrance of this discourse of what it is to be spiritually minded, it was reduced to three heads. First, the habitual frame, disposition, and inclination of the mind in its affections. Second, the usual exercise of the mind in its thoughts, meditations, and desires about heavenly things. Wherein to thirdly was added the complacency of mind in that relish and savor which it finds in spiritual things so thought and meditated on. The second of these has been spoken to, is that which leads away to the others, and gives the most sensible evidence of the state inquired after. And this consists of stream, which rising in the fountain of our affections, runs into a holy rest and complacency of mind. The first and last I shall now handle together, and therein comprehend the account of what it is to be spiritually minded. Spiritual affections, in which the soul adheres to spiritual things, taken in such a savor and relish of them, as wherein it finds rest and satisfaction, is the peculiar spring and substance of our being spiritually minded. This is that which I shall now further explain and confirm. The great contest of heaven and earth is about the affections of the poor worm which we call man. That the world should contend for them is no wonder. It is the best that it can pretend to. All things here below are capable of no higher ambition than to be possessed of the affections of men, and as they lie under the curse, it can do us no greater mischief than by prevailing in this design. But that the holy God should, as it were, engage in the contest and strive for the affections of man is an effect of infinite condescension and grace. This he does expressly. My son, he says, give me thine heart. Proverbs twenty three twenty six. It is our affections he asks for, and comparatively nothing else. To be sure, he will accept of nothing from us without them. The most fat and costly sacrifice will not be accepted if it be without a heart. All the ways and methods of the dispensation of his will by his word, all the designs of his effectual grace are suited to and prepared for this end, namely to recover the affections of man to himself. So he expresses himself concerning his word in Deuteronomy 10.12. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul? As to the word of his grace, he declares it to the same purpose in chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord your God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of your seed, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And on the other side, all the artifices of the world, all the pain it puts on its face, all the great promises it makes, and the false appearances and attire it clothes itself with by the help of Satan, have no other end but to draw and keep the affections of men to itself. And if the world be preferred before God in this address, which is made to us for our affections, we shall justly perish with the world to eternity and be rejected by him whom we have rejected. Proverbs 1, verses 24 to 31. Our affections are upon the mantor, our all. They are all we have to give or bestow. The only power of our souls in which we may give away ourselves from ourselves and become another's. Other faculties of our souls, even the most noble of them, are suited to receive in unto our own advantage. By our affections we can give away what we are and have. In this we give our hearts to God as he requires. Therefore, to him we give our affections, to whom we give our selves and all that we have, and to whom we give them not, whatever we give, upon a manner we give nothing at all. And what we do to or for others, whatsoever is good, valuable, or praiseworthy in it, proceeds from the affection wherewith we do it. To do anything for others without an animating affection is but a contempt for them, for we judge them really unworthy that we should do anything for them. 
to give to the poor upon their importunity without pity or compassion, to supply the wants of the saints without love or kindness, with other actings and duties of the like nature, are things of no value, things that recommend us neither to God nor men. It is so in general with God in the world. Whatever we do in the service of God, whatever duty we perform on His command, whatever we undergo or suffer for His name's sake, if it doesn't proceed from the cleaving of our souls to Him by our affections, it is despised by Him, He doesn't own it. As if a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly contemned. Song of Solomon 8, 7. It is not to be bought or purchased with riches. So if a man would give to God and the substance of his house without love, it would in like manner be despised. And however, on the other hand, we may be diligent, industrious, and sedulous in and about the things of this world, yet if it is not our affections, we are not of the world, we belong not to it. There the seat of all sincerity, which is the jewel of divine and human conversation, the life and soul of everything that is good and praiseworthy. Whatever men pretend, as their affections are, so are they. Hypocrisy is a deceitful interposition of the mind, on various reasons and pretenses, between men's affections and their profession, in which a man appears to be what he is not. Sincerity is the open avowalment of the reality of men's affections, which renders them good and useful. Affections are in the soul as the helm in the ship. If it be laid hold on by a skillful hand, he turns the whole vessel which way he pleases. If God has the powerful hand of his grace upon our affections, he turns our souls to a compliance with his institutions, instructions, in mercy, afflictions, trials, all sorts of providences, and holds them firm against all winds and storms of temptation, that they shall not hurry them on pernicious dangers. Such a soul alone is tractable and pliable to all intimations of God's will. All others are stubborn and obstinate, stout-hearted and far from righteousness. And when the world has a hand on our affections, it turns the mind with the whole industry of the soul to its interest and concerns. And it is in vain to contend with anything that has the power of our affections in its disposal, it will prevail at last. On all these considerations, it is of the highest importance to consider aright how things are stated in our affections, and what is the prevailing bent of them. Iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend, saith the wise man. Proverbs 27, verse 17. Every man has his edge, which may be sharpened by outward helps and advantages. The predominant inclination of a man's affections is his edge. According as that is set, so he cuts and works. That way he is sharp and keen, but blunt to all other things. Now because it must be that our affections are either spiritual or earthly in a prevailing degree, that either God has our hearts or the world, that our edge is towards heaven or towards things here below, before I come to give an account of the nature and operations of spiritual affections, I shall consider and propose some of those arguments and motives which God is pleased to make use of to call off our affections from the desirable things of this world, for as they are weighty and cogent, such as cannot be neglected without the greatest contempt of divine wisdom and goodness, so they serve to press and enforce those arguments and motives that are proposed to us to set our affections on things that are above, which is to be spiritually minded. First he has, in all manner of instances, poured contempt on the things of this world in comparison to things spiritual and heavenly. All things here below were at first made beautiful and in order and were declared by God himself to be exceeding good, and that not only in their being in nature, but in the use in which they were designed. They were then desirable to men, and the enjoyment of them would have been a blessing without danger or temptation, for they were the ordinance of God to lead us to the knowledge of Him and love to Him. But since the entrance of sin, in which the world fell under the curse and into the power of Satan, the things of it and His management are become effectual means to draw off the heart and affections from God. For it is the world and the things of it is summed up by the Apostle in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, they strive alone for our affections to be the objects of them. Sin and Satan do but woo for the world to take them off from God. 
By them does the God of this world blind the eyes of them that believe not, and the principal way in which he works in them is by promises of satisfaction to all the lusts of the minds of men, with a proposal of whatever is dreadful and terrible in the want of them. Being now in this state and condition, and used to this end, through the craft of Satan and the folly of the minds of men, God has showed by various instances that they are all vain, empty, unsatisfactory in every way to be despised in comparison of things eternal. First, he did it most eminently and signally in the life, death, and cross of Christ. What can be seen or found in this world after the Son of God has spent his life in it, not having where to lay his head, and after he went out of it on the cross? Had there been aught of real worth in things here below, certainly he had enjoyed it, if not crowns and empires which were all in his power, yet such goods and possessions as men of sober reasonings and moderate affections esteem a competency. But things were quite otherwise disposed to manifest that there is nothing of value or use in these things, but only to support nature to the performance of service to God, in which they are serviceable to eternity. He never attained, he never enjoyed more than daily supplies of bread out of the stores of providence, and which alone he has instructed us to pray for, Matthew 6, verse 11. In his cross, the world proclaimed all its good qualities and all its powers, and has given to them that believe its naked face to view and contemplate. Nor is it now one jot more comely than it was when it had gotten Christ on the cross. Hence is that inference and conclusion of the Apostle in Galatians 6, 14. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, in which the world is crucified to me and I into the world. Since I have believed... Since I have had a sense of the power and virtue of the cross of Christ, I have done with all things in this world. It is a dead thing to me, nor have I any affection for it. This is that which made the difference between the promises of the old covenant and the new. For they were many of them about temporal things, the good things of this world and this life. Those of the new are mostly of things spiritual and eternal. God would not call off the church wholly from a regard to these things until he had given a sufficient demonstration of their emptiness, vanity, and insufficiency in the cross of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Where are you going so fast, my friend? What means this rising so early and going to bed late, eating the bread of carefulness? Why this diligence? Why these contrivances? Why these savings and hoardings of riches and wealth? To what end is all this care and counsel? Alas, saith one, it is to get that which is enough in and of this world for me and my children, to prefer them to raise an estate for them, which, if not so great as others, may yet be a competency to give them some satisfaction in their lives and some reputation in the world. Fair pretenses, neither shall I ever discourage any from the exercise of industry in their lawful callings. But yet I know that with many this is but a pretense and covering for a shameful engagement of their affections to the world. Therefore in all these things be persuaded sometimes to have an eye to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Behold how he is set before us in the gospel, poor, despised, reproached, persecuted, nailed to the cross, and all by this world. Whatever be your designs and aims, let his cross continually interpose between your affections in this world. If you are believers, your hopes are within a few days to be with him forevermore. Unto him you must give an account of yourselves and what you have done in this world. Will it be acceptable with him to declare what you have saved of this world, what you have gained, what you have preserved and embraced yourselves in, and what you have left behind you? Was this any part of his employment and business in this world? Has he left us an example for any such course? Therefore no man can set his affections on things here below who has any regard to the pattern of Christ, or is in any measure influenced with the power and efficacy of his cross. My love is crucified, said a holy martyr of old. He whom his soul loved was so, and in him is love to all things here below. Do you, therefore, find your affections ready to be engaged to or too much entangled with the things of this world? Are your desires of increasing them, your hopes of keeping them, 
your fears of losing them, your love to them and delight in them, operative in your minds, possessing your thoughts and influencing your conversations. Turn aside a little, and by faith contemplate the life and death of the Son of God. A blessed mirror will it be, where you may see what contemptible things they are which you perplex yourselves about. Oh, that any of us should love or esteem the things of this world, the power, riches, goods, or reputation of it, who have had a spiritual view of them in the cross of Christ. It may be, it will be said, that the circumstances mentioned were necessary to the Lord Christ with respect to the special work he had to do as a Savior and Redeemer of the Church, and therefore it does not hence follow that we ought to be poor and want all things as he did. I confess it does not and therefore do all along make an allowance for honest industry in our callings. But this follows unavoidably hereon, that what he did forego and trample on for our sake, that ought not to be the object of our affections, nor can such affections prevail in us if he dwell in our hearts by faith. Number two. He has done the same in his dealings with the apostles, and generally with all that have been most dear to him, and instrumental to the interest of his glory in the world especially since life and immortality were brought to light by the gospel. He had great work to do by the apostles, and that of the greatest use to his interest and kingdom. The laying of the foundations of the glorious kingdom of Christ in the world was committed to them. Who would not think that he should provide for them, if not principalities or popedoms, yet at least archbishoprics and bishoprics with other good ecclesiastical dignities and preferments? By this might they have been made meet to converse with princes, and been freed from the contempt of the vulgar. But infinite wisdom did otherwise dispose of them and their concerns in this world. For as God was pleased to exercise them with the common afflictions and calamities of this life, which he makes use of to take off the sweetness of present enjoyments, so they lived and died in a condition of poverty, distress, persecution, and reproach. God set them forth as examples to other ends, namely of light, grace, zeal, and holiness in their lives, so as to manifest of how little concernment unto our own blessedness or an interest in his love is the abundance of all things here below, is also that the want of them all may consist with the highest participation of his love and favor. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9, and verses 11 to 13. I think that God has set forth us, the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle to the world and to angels and to men. Even to this present hour we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled we bless, being persecuted we suffer it. Being defamed we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things to this day. And if the consideration of this be not of weight with others, undoubtedly it ought to be so with them who are called to preach the gospel and are the successors to the apostles. There can be nothing more uncouth, absurd, and shameful, nothing more opposite to the intimation of the wisdom and will of God in his dealings with those first and most honorable dispensers of it, than for such persons to seek and follow greedily after secular advantages and worldly power, riches, wealth, and honor. So there has been in former ages an endeavor to separate such persons as were by any means dedicated to the ministry of the gospel from all secular dignities and revenues. Yea, some maintained that they were to enjoy nothing of their own, but were to live on alms or the free contributions of the people. But this was quickly condemned as heresy in Wycliffe and others. Yet another sort set up that would pretend thereunto as to themselves, Though they would not oblige all others to the same rule, this produced some swarms of begging friars whom they of the church, who were in possession of wealth and power, thought it fit to laugh at and let alone. Of late years this contest is at an end. The clergy have happily gotten a victory, and esteem all due to them that they can by any ways obtain, nor is there any great crime than for a man to be otherwise minded. But these things are not for our present concern. From the beginning it was not so. 
And it is well if, in such a way, men are able to maintain the frame of mind inquired after, which is life and peace. Number three, God continues to cast contempt on these things, by giving always incomparably the greatest portion of them to the vilest man and his own avowed enemies. This is a temptation under the old covenant, but it is highly instructive under the new. None will judge those things to be of real value which a wise man casts out daily to swine, making little or no use of them in his family. Those monsters of men, Nero and Heliogobalus, had more interest in and more power over the things of this world than ever had the best of men. Such villains in nature, so pernicious to human society, that their not being was the interest of mankind, but yet more of the world poured on them than they knew either how to enjoy, possess, use, or abuse. Look on all the principal treasures and powers of this world is in the hand of one of these monsters, and they are disposed of by divine providence, and you may see at what rate God values them. At this day the greatest, most noble, wealthy, and fruitful parts of the earth are given to the great Turk, with some other eastern potentates, either Mohammedans or pagans, who are prepared for eternal destruction. And if we look nearer home, we may see in whose hands is the power of the chiefest nations of Europe, and at what end is it used. The utmost of what some Christian professors among ourselves are intent and designed upon is that which would render them wondrous, happy, in their own apprehensions, puts hundreds of them together, and it would not answer the waste made by the forementioned beasts every day. Does not God proclaim in this that the things of this world are not to be valued or esteemed? If they were so and had a real worth in themselves, would the holy and righteous God make such a distribution of them? The most of those whom he loves, who enjoy his favor, not only have comparatively the meanest share of them, but are exercised with all the evils that the destitution and want of them can be accompanied with. His open and avowed enemies, in the meantime, have more than they know what to do with. Who would set his heart and affections on those things which God pours into the bosoms of the vilest men, to be a snare to them here and an aggravation of their condemnation forever? It seems you may go and take the world and take the curse, death, and hell along with it. But what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What can any man do on the consideration of this? who will not forego all his hopes and expectations from God, but retreat to the faith of things spiritual and eternal, as containing an excellency in them incomparably above all that he enjoyed here below. Number four. He continues to give perpetual instances of their uncertainty and unsatisfactoriness, and the utter disappointment of men that have had expectations from them. The ways in which are so various, and the instances so multiplied, is that most men in the world, unless they are like the fool in the gospel, who bade his soul take its ease for many years, because his barns were full, live in perpetual fears and apprehensions that they shall speedily lose whatever they enjoy, or are under the power of stupid security. But as to this consideration of them, there is such an account given by the wise man, as to which nothing can be added, or which no reason or experience is able to contradict, Ecclesiastes 2. By these and the like ways does God cast contempt on all things here below, discovering the folly and falseness of the promises which the world makes use of to allure our affections to itself. This, therefore, is to be laid as a foundation in all our considerations to what or whom we shall cleave by our affections, that God has not only declared the insufficiency of these things to give us that rest and happiness which we seek after, but also poured contempt upon them and his holy wise disposal of them in the world. Secondly, God has added to their vanity by shortening the lives of men, reducing their continuance in this world to so short and uncertain a season, it is as impossible that they should take any solid satisfaction in what they enjoy here below. So it is expressed by the psalmist, Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. So he draws two conclusions. Number one, that every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Number two, that every man walks in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heaps up riches and knows not who shall gather them. Psalm 39, 5 and 6. 
The uncertainty and shortness of the lives of men render all their endeavors and contrivances about earthly things both vain and foolish. When men lived eight or nine hundred years, they had opportunity to suck out all the sweetness that was in creature comforts, to make large provisions of them, and to have long projections about them. But when they had so, they all issued in that violence, oppression, and wickedness which brought the flood on the world of ungodly men. And it still so abides. The more of, and the longer men enjoy these things, the more without the sovereign preservative of grace will they abound in sin and provocation of God. But God has reduced the life of man to the small pittance of seventy years, casting what may fall out of a long continuance into travail and sorrow. Besides that space is shortened with the most, by various and innumerable incidences and occasions. Therefore, in these seventy years, consider how long it is before men begin to have a taste or gust of the things of this life. How many things fall in cross to make us weary of them before the end of our days. How few among us, not one of a thousand, attain that age. What is the uncertainty of all men living as to the continuance of their lives to the next day? And we shall see that the holy wise God has left no such season for their enjoyment as might put a value upon them. And when, on the other hand, it is remembered that this man who is of such short continuance in this world is yet made for eternity, eternal blessedness or misery, which state depends wholly on his interest on things above and setting his affections on them, they must forfeit all their reason as well as bid defiance to the grace of God who gives them up to things below. Thirdly, God has openly and fully declared the danger that is in these things, as to their enjoyment and use, and what multitudes of souls miscarry by an inordinate adherence to them, for they are the matter of those temptations in which the souls of men are ruined forever, the fuel that supplies the fire of their lusts until they are consumed by it. Men under the power of spiritual convictions fall not into sin, fell not eternally, but by the means of temptation. That is a mire in which this rush doth grow. As for others who live and die in the madness and wildness of nature, without any restraint in their minds from the power of convictions, they need no external temptations, but only opportunities to exert their lusts. But as for those who by any means are convinced of sin, righteousness, and judgment, so as to design the ordering of their lives with respect to the sense they have of them, they don't fall into actual sin, but upon temptations, that whatever it be which causes, occasions, and prevails on a convinced person to sin, that is temptation. Therefore this is the great means of the ruin of the souls of men. Now though there are many principles of temptation, many causes that actually concur to its efficacy as sin, Satan, and other men, yet the manner of almost all ruinous temptations is taken out of this world and the things of it. From this does Satan take all his darts. From this do evil men derive all the ways and means in which they corrupt others. And from this is all the fuel of sin and lust taken. And which adds to this evil, all that is in the world contributes its utmost to it. All that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, 1 John 2.16. It is not a direct formal enumeration of these things that are in the world, nor a distribution of them under several heads, but it is so of the principal lusts of the minds of men, in which all things in the world are subservient. Therefore not only the matter of all temptations is taken out of the world, but everything that is in the world is apt and fit to be abused to that end. For it were easy to show that there is nothing desirable or valuable in this whole world, but it is reducible to a subserviency to one or other of these lusts, and is applicable to the interests and service of temptations and sins. When men hear of these things, they are apt to say, Let the dream be unto them that are openly wicked, and the interpretation of it to them that are profligate in sin. Unto unclean persons, drunkards, oppressors, proud, ambitious persons, it may be it is so, but as to them they use the things of this world with a due moderation, so as they are no snare to them. But to own they are used to what end soever, if the affections of men are set upon them, one way or other, there is nothing in the world but is thus a snare and temptation. 
However, we should be very careful how we adhere to or undervalue that which is the cause and means of the ruin of multitudes of souls. By the warnings given us of this, does God design as to the use of means to teach us the vanity and danger of fixing our affections on things below? Fourthly, things are so ordered in the holy wise dispensation of God's providence that it requires much spiritual wisdom to distinguish between the use and the abuse of these things, between a lawful care about them and an inordinate cleaving to them. Few distinguish a right here, and therefore in these things will many find their great mistake at the last day. For the disappointments that they will fall under as to what concerns their earthly enjoyments and the use of them in which they were entrusted, see Matthew twenty-five thirty-four to the end of the chapter, it is granted that there is a lawful use of these things, a lawful care and industry about them, so it is also acknowledged it cannot be denied that there is an abuse of them, springing from an inordinate love and cleaving to them. But here men deceive themselves, taking their measures by the most crooked, uncertain rules. Some make their own inclinations a rule and measure of what is lawful and allowable, some the example of others, some the course of this world, some their own real or pretended necessities. They confess that there is an inordinate love of those things and an abuse of them in excesses of various sorts which the scripture plainly affirms and which experience gives open testimony to. But as to their state and circumstances, their care, love, and industry are all allowable. That which influences all these persons is self-love which inveterate corrupt affections and false reasonings make an application of to these occasions. So we have men approving of themselves as just stewards of their enjoyments, while others judge them hard, covetous, earthly-minded, no way laying out what they are entrusted with to the glory of God in any due proportion. Others also think not amiss of themselves in this kind, who live in palpable excesses, either of pride of life or sensual pleasures, vain apparel or the like. So in particular, most men in their feastings and entertainments walk in direct contempt of the rule which our Savior gives in that case in Luke fourteen twelve to 14 and yet approve themselves in it. But what if any of us should be mistaken in our rule and the application of it to our conditions? Men at sea may have a fair gale of wind, in which they may sail freely and smoothly for a season, and yet instead of being brought into a port, be cast by it at last on destructive shells or rocks. And what if that which we esteem allowable, love, care, and industry, should prove to be the fruit of earthly affections, inordinate and predominant in us? What if we miss in our measures? and that which we approve of in ourselves should be disproved of God. We are cast out forever. We belong to the world, and with the world we shall perish. It may be said that if it be so difficult to distinguish between these things, namely the lawful use of things here below and their abuse, the allowable industry about them and the inordinate love of them, on the knowledge of which our eternal condition depends, it is impossible but men must spend their time in solicitous anxiety of mind, is not knowing when they have a right discharge their duty. Answer 1. I press these things at present no further, but only to allow how dangerous a thing it is for any to incline in its affections to the things of this world, and which in excess is ruinous and hardly discoverable. Surely no wise man will venture freely and frequently to the edge of such a precipice. He will be jealous of his measures, lest they will not hold by the rule of the word. And a due sense of this is the best preservative of the soul from cleaving inordinately to things below. And when God in any instance, by afflictions or otherwise, shows to believers their transgression in it, and how they have exceeded, Job 36, 8-9, it makes them careful for the future. They will now or never be diligent that they fall not under that peremptory rule. First John 2, verse 15, number 2. When the soul is upright and sincere, there is no need in this case of any more solicitousness or anxiety of mind than there is to or about other duties. But when it is biased and acted by self-love and its more strong inclinations to things present, It is impossible men should enjoy solid peace or be free from severe reflections on them by their own consciences. 
in such seasons in which they are awakened to their duty in the consideration of their state, nor have I anything to tender for their relief. With others it is not so, and therefore I shall so far digress in this place, as to give some directions to those who, in sincerity, would be satisfied in the lawful use and enjoyment of earthly things, so as not to adhere to them with inordinate affection. Number one, remember always that you are not proprietors or absolute possessors of those things, but only stewards of them. With respect to men, you are or may be just proprietors of what you enjoy, but with respect to him who is the great possessor of heaven and earth, you are but stewards. The stewardship we are to give an account of, as we are taught in the parable in Luke 16, verses 1 and 2. This rule always attended to will be a blessed guide in all instances and occasions of duty. But if a man be left in trust with houses and large possessions as a steward for the right lord, owner, and proprietor of them, if he fall into a pleasing dream that they are all his own, and use them accordingly, it will be a woeful surprise to him when he shall be called to an account for all that he has received and laid out, whether he will or not, and when indeed he has nothing to pay. It will scarce be otherwise with him at the great day who forgot the trust which is committed to them, and suppose they may do what they will with what they call their own. Number two. There is nothing in the ways of getting, enjoying, or using of these things, but gives its own evidence to spiritual wisdom, whether it be within the bounds of duty or not. Men are not lightly deceived in this, but when they are evidently under the power of corrupt affections, or will not at all attend to themselves in the language of their own consciences, it is a man's own fault alone if he know not in what he exceeds. A due examination of ourselves in the sight of God with respect to these things, the frame and actings of our mind in them, will greatly give check to our corrupt inclinations and discover the folly of those reasonings in which we deceive ourselves into the love of earthly things or justify ourselves in them and bring to light the secret principles of self-love which is the root of all this evil. Number three. If you would be able to make a right judgment in this case, be sure that you have another object for your affections, which has a predominant interest in your minds, and which will evidence itself so to have on all occasions. Let a man be never so observant of himself as to all outward duties required of him with respect to these earthly things. Let him be liberal in the disposal of them on all occasions. Let him be watchful against all intemperance and excesses in the use of them. Yet if he is not another object for his affections, which has a prevailing influence upon them, if they are not set upon the things that are above one way or other, it is a world that has a possession of his heart. For the affections of our minds will and must be placed in chief on things below or things above. There will be a predominant love in us, and therefore, although all our actions should testify another frame, Yet if God and the things of God be not the principal object of our affections, by one way or other to the world we belong. This is that which is taught so expressly by our Savior in Luke 16, verses 9 to 13. And I say unto you, Make yourself friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fell, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Number four. Labor continually for the mortification of your affections to the things of this world. They are, in a state of corrupted nature, set and fixed on them, nor will any reasonings or considerations effectually divert them, or take them off in a due manner, unless they are mortified to them by the cross of Christ. Whatever change be otherwise worked in them, it will be of no advantage to us. It is mortification alone that will take them off from earthly things to the glory of God. So the Apostle, having given us that charge, set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth, Colossians 3.2, 
and this is the only way and means we may do so. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Verse 5. Let no man think that his affections will fall off from earthly things of their own accord. The keenness and sharpness of them in many things may be abated by the decay of their natural powers and age and the like. They may be mated by frequent disappointments, by sicknesses, pains, and afflictions, as we shall see immediately. They may be willing to a distribution of earthly enjoyments to have the reputation of it in which they still cleave to the world, but under another shape and appearance. Or they may be startled by conviction so as to do many things gladly that belong to another frame. But on one pretense or other, under one appearance or other, they will forever adhere or cleave to earthly things unless they are mortified to them through faith in the blood and cross of Christ, Galatians 6.14. Whatever thoughts you may have of yourselves in this manner, unless you have the experience of a work of mortification on your affections, you can have no refreshing ground of assurance that you are in anything spiritually minded. Number 5. In all the instances of duty belonging to your stewardship of earthly things, attend diligently to the rule of the word, Without this, the grace exhorted to may be abused. So of old, under a pretense of a relinquishment of the things of this world, because of the danger in adhering to them, their own superstition and the craft of other men prevailed with many to part with all they had to the service of others, not better, it may be not so good, as themselves. This evil wholly arose from a lack of attendance to the rule of truth, which gives no such direction in ordinary cases. But there is not much seen in these days of an excess in this kind. But on the other hand, in all instances of duties of this nature, most men's minds are habitually influenced with pretenses, reasonings, and considerations to turn the scales as to what they ought to do in proportion in this duty on the side of the world. If you would be safe, you must, in all instances of duty, as in works of charity, piety, and compassion, give authority in and over your souls to the rule of the word. Let neither self nor unbelief nor the custom and example of others be heard to speak. But let the rule alone be attended to, and to what that speaks yield obedience. Unless these things are found in us, none of us, no man living, if he be not so with him, can have any refreshing evidence or assurance that he is not under the power of an inordinate, yea, and predominant love to this world. And indeed, to add a little further on the occasion of this digression, it is a sad thing to have this exception made against the state of any man on just grounds. Yea, but he loves the world. He is sober and industrious. He is constant in duties of religion. It may be an earnest preacher of them, a man of sound principles and blameless as to the excesses of life, but he loves the world. The question is, how does this appear? It may be what you say is but one of those evil surmises which all things are filled with. Therefore I speak it not at all to give countenance to the rash judging of others, which none are more prone to than those who one way or other are eminently guilty themselves. But I would have every man judge himself that we be none of us condemned of the Lord. If notwithstanding the things mentioned, any of us do center in self, which is supplied and filled with the world, if we prefer self above all other things, do aim at the satisfaction of self in what we do, well or ill, are useless to the only good and blessed end of these earthly things, in supplying the wants of others according to the proportions in which we are entrusted, it is to be feared that the world and the things that are in it have the principal interest in our affections. And the danger is yet greater with them who divert on the other extreme. Such are they who in the pride of life, vanity in apparel, excess in drinking, pampering the flesh every day, tread close on the hills of the world, if they do not also fully keep company with it. Altogether in vain is it for such persons to countenance themselves with an appearance of other graces in them, or the sedulous performance of other duties. This one rule will eternally prevail against them. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And by the way, let men take heed how they walk in any instance against the known judgment and practice of the wiser or more experienced sort of Christians, to their regret and sorrow, if not to their offense and scandal, 
or in any way in which they win the consent of their own light and conscience by such reasonings and considerations as will not hold weight in the balance of the sanctuary. Yet thus and no otherwise is it with all them who under a profession of religion indulge any excesses in which they are conformed to the world. Fifthly, God makes a hedge against the excess of the affections of men rational in any way enlightened to the things of this world by allowing the generality of men to carry the use of them and to be carried by the abuse of them into acting so filthy, so abominable, so ridiculous as reason itself cannot but abhor. Men by them transform themselves into beasts and monsters as might be manifested by all sorts of instances. Hence a wise man prayed against riches lest he should not be able to manage the temptations in which they are accompanied. Proverbs 30, verses 8 and 9. Lastly, to close this manner and to show us what we are to expect in case we set our affections on things here below, and they have thereby a predominant interest in our hearts, God has positively determined and declared that if it be so, he will have nothing to do with us, nor will accept of those affections which we pretend we can and do spare for him in spiritual things. If we abstain from open sins, if we abhor the lewdness and uncleanness of men in the world, if we are constant in religious duties and give ourselves up to walk with the most strict sword in religion, like Paul in his Pharisaism, may we not, will some say or think, find acceptance with God, though our hearts cleave inordinately to the things of this world? I say God has peremptorily determined the contrary, and if other arguments will not prevail with us, he leaves us at last to this. Go love the world and the things of it, but know assuredly you do it to the eternal loss of your souls. 1 John 2 verse 15 James 4 verse 4 These few instances have I given of the arguments and motives in which God is pleased to deter us from fixing our affections on things here below, and there are most of them such only as he makes use of in the administration of his providence. There are two other heads of things that offer themselves to our consideration first. The ways, means, arguments, and enticements which the world makes use of to draw, keep, and secure the affections of men to itself. Number two, the secret powerful efficacy of grace in taking off the heart from these things and turning and drawing it to God with the arguments and motives that the Holy Spirit makes use of in and by the word to this end in which we must show what is the act of conquering grace, in which the heart is finally prevailed on to choose and adhere to God and love immutable. But these things cannot be handled in any measure according to their nature and importance without such length of discourse, is that I cannot here divert to. I shall therefore proceed to that which is a proper and peculiar subject before us. End of chapter 11 The Grace and Duty of Being Spiritually Minded John Owen Chapter 12. What is required in and to our affections that they may be spiritual? A threefold work on the affections described. To declare the interest of our affections in this frame of being spiritually minded, and what they contribute to this, I shall do these three things first. Declare what is required to this, that our affections may be spiritual, and which lies the foundation of the whole duty. Secondly, what are their actings when they are so spiritually? Thirdly, what are the means in which they may be kept and preserved in that frame, with a number of other things of the like nature? How our affections are concerned in or do belong to the frame of mind inquired after has been before declared. Without spiritual affections we cannot be spiritually minded. And that they may be of this use, three things are required. First, their principle. Secondly, their object. Thirdly, the way and manner of their application to their proper object by virtue of that principle. First is to the principle acting in them, that our affections may be spiritual in the spring of our being spiritually minded. It is required that they be changed, renewed, and inlaid with grace, spiritual and supernatural. To clear the sense of this, we must a little consider what is their state by nature, and then by what means they may be wrought upon as to a change or a renovation. For they are like to some things which in themselves and their own nature are poisonous. 
but being corrected and receiving a due temperament from a mixture of other ingredients become medicinal and of excellent use. By nature our affections, all of them, are depraved and corrupted. Nothing in the whole nature of man, no power or faculty of the soul, is fallen under greater disorder and deprivation by the entrance of sin than our affections are. And in by them is the heart wholly gone and turned off from God, Titus 3, verse 3. It were a long work to set forth this deprivation of our affections, nor does it belong to our present design. Some few things I shall briefly observe concerning it, to make way to what is proposed concerning their change. Number 1. This is the only corruption and deprivation of our nature by the fall evident in and to reason or delight of nature itself. Those who were wise among the heathen both saw it and complained of it. They found a weakness in the mind, but saw nothing of its darkness and deprivation as to things spiritual. But they were sensible enough of this disorder and tumult of the affections and things moral, which renders the minds of men like the troubled sea whose waters cast up mire and dirt. This greatly aggravates the neglect of them who are not sensible of it in themselves, seeing it is discernible in the light of nature. Number two, they are as depraved, the seat and subject of all lusts, both of the flesh and of the spirit. Yea, lust or evil concupiscence is nothing but the irregular motion and acting of our affections is depraved, defiled, corrupted. Romans 7 verse 8. Hence no one sin can be mortified without a change wrought in the affections. Number three, they are the spring, root, and cause of all actual sin in the world. Matthew 15 verse 19. The evil heart in the scripture is the corrupt affections of it, with the imaginations of the mind in which they are excited and acted, Genesis 6, verse 5. These are they which at this time fill the whole world with wickedness, darkness, confusion, and terror. And we may learn what is their force and efficacy from these effects. So the nature of the plague is most evident when we see thousands dying of it every week. Number 4. They are the way and means in which the soul applies itself to all sinful objects and actings. So are they called our members, our earthly members, because as a body applies itself to its operations by its members, so does the soul apply itself to what belongs to it by its affections, Romans 6.13, Colossians 3.5. Number 5. They will not be under the conduct of the mind, its lighter convictions. Rebellion against the light of the mind is the very form in which their corruption acts itself. Job 24, verse 13. Let the apprehensions of the mind and its notions of good and evil be what they will. They reject them and lead the soul in pursuit of their inclinations. So no natural man whatsoever does in any measure answer the light of his mind or the convictions of his understanding. But he sees and approves of better things, following those that are worse. And there is no greater spiritual judgment than for men to be given up to themselves and their own evil affections. Romans 1.26 Many other instances might be given of the greatness of that deprivation which our affections are fallen under by sin. These may suffice to our present purpose. In general, this deprivation of our affections by nature may be reduced to two heads. Number one, an utter aversion from God in all spiritual things. And this lies the spring of all that dislike of God and his ways that the hearts of men are filled with. Yea, they do not only produce an aversion from them and dislike of them, but they fill the mind with an enmity against them. Therefore men say in their hearts to God, Depart from us, for we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit should we have if we pray to him? Job 21, verses 14 and 15. Romans 1, verse 28, and Romans 8, verse 7. Number 2. An inordinate cleaving to things vain, earthly, and sensual, causing the soul to engage into the pursuit of them as a horse rushes into the battle. While our affections are in this state and condition, we are far enough from being spiritually minded, nor is it possible to engage them into an adherence to or delight in spiritual things. In this state they may be two ways wrought upon, and yet not so renewed as to be serviceable to the sin, number one. There may be various temporary impressions made on them. Sometimes there is so by the preaching of the word. 
Hereon men may hear it with joy and do many things gladly. Sometimes it is so by judgments, dangers, sicknesses, apprehensions of the approach of death. Psalm 128, verses 35 to 37. These things take men off for a season from their greedy delight in earthly things, and a pursuit of the interest of lust and making provision for the flesh. On many other occasions, by great variety of causes, there may be temporary impressions made on the affections, that shall seem for a season to have turned a stream of them. And thereon we have many who any day will be holy, as it were, for God, resolved to forsake sin and all the pleasures of it, but the next return unto all their former excesses. For this is the effect of those impressions, that whereas men ordinarily are predominantly acted by love, desire, and delight, which leads them to act according to the true natural principles of the soul, now they are for a season acted by fear and dread, which put a kind of force on all their inclinations. Hereon they have other thoughts of good and evil, of things eternal and temporal, of God and their own duty for a season. And hereon some of them may and do persuade themselves that there is a change in their hearts and affections, which there is not. Like a man who persuades himself that he has lost his egg because his present fit is over. The next trial of temptation carries him away again to the world and sin. There are sometimes sudden impressions made on spiritual affections which are always of great advantage to the soul, renewing its engagements to God and duty. So was it with Jacob in Genesis 28:16 to 20. So is it often with believers in hearing the word and on other occasions. On all of them they renew their clearings to God with love and delight. But the effect of these impressions on unrenewed affections are neither spiritual nor durable. Yea, for the most part they are but checks given in the providence of God to the raging of their lusts. Psalm 9.20 Number 2. They are liable to an habitual change. This the experience of all ages gives testimony to. There may be an habitual change wrought in the passions and affections of the mind as to the inordinate and violent pursuit of their inclinations without any gracious renovation of them. Education, philosophy or reason, long affliction, spiritual light and gifts have wrought this change. So Paul, upon his call to be king, became another man. Hereby persons naturally passionate and furious have been made sedate and moderate and those who have been sensual have become temperate, yea, and haters of religion to be professors of it. All these things and many more of the like nature have proceeded from a change wrought upon the affections only, while the mind, will, and conscience have been totally unsanctified. By this change, when it is alone, no man ever became spiritually minded. For whereas there are two parts of the deprivation of our affections, that in which they are turned off from God, and that in which they inordinately cleave to other things, their change principally, if not only, respects the latter. They are brought into some order with respect to present things. The mind is not continually tossed up and down by them as the waves of the sea, that are troubled, and cast up mire and dirt. They do not carry those in whom they are into vicious sensual actions, but they allow them to make virtue in moderation, sobriety, temperance, fidelity, and usefulness in several ways to be their design. And it is admirable to think what degrees of eminency in all sorts of moral virtues. Upon this one principle of moderating the affections, even many among the heathens attain too. But as to their aversion from God and spiritual things and the true spiritual notion of them, they are not cured by this change. At least this change may be, and yet this latter not be wrought. Again, this alteration does but turn the coarser stream of men's affections. It does not change the nature of them. They are the same in their spring and fountain as ever they were, only they are habituated to another course than what of themselves they are inclined to. You may take a young whelp of the most fierce and savage creature, as of a tiger or a wolf, and by customer usage make it as tame and harmless as any domestic creature, a dog or the like, but although it may be turned into quite another way or course of acting than what it was of itself inclined to, yet its nature is not changed, and therefore frequently on occasion, opportunity or provocation, it will fall into its own savage inclination, and having tasted of the blood of creatures, it will never be reclaimed. So is it with the depraved affections of men with respect to their change. 
Their streams are turned, they are habituated to a new course, but their nature is not altered, at least not from rational to spiritual, from earthly to heavenly. Yet this is that which was most beautiful and desirable in nature, the glory of it and the utmost of its attainments. He who has by any means proceeded to such a moderation of his affections as to render him kind, benign, patient, useful, preferring public good before private, ordinate and temperate in all things, will rise up in judgment against those who profess in themselves to be under the conduct of the light of grace, do yet by being morose, angry, selfish, worldly, manifest that their affections are not subdued by the power of that grace. Therefore, that we may be spiritually minded, there is yet another work upon our affections required, which is their internal renovation, in which not only the course of their actings is changed, but their nature is altered and spiritually renewed. I intend that which is expressed in that great evangelical promise in Isaiah 11, verses 6 to 9. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and a calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. And a cow and a bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and a lion shall eat straw like the ox. And a sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on a cockatrice den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. A change in alteration is promised in the nature's principles and first inclinations of the worst and most savage sinners who pass under the power of gospel grace. This is that which is required of us in a way of duty, Ephesians 4, verse 23. Be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. There is a renovation of the mind itself by the communication of spiritual saving light and understanding thereunto, and which I have treated elsewhere at large. But the spirit of the mind, that in which it is enlivened, led, and disposed to its actings, that is to be renewed also. The spirit of the mind in this context, is opposed to the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, or depraved affections, Ephesians 4.22. These, therefore, are that spirit of the mind which inclines, bends, and leads it to act suitably to its inclinations, which is to be renewed. And when our affections are inclined by the saving grace of the Holy Spirit, then are they renewed and not else. No other change will give them a spiritual renovation. By this, those things which are only natural affections in themselves, and them that believe become fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so on. They continue the same as they were in their essence, substance, and natural powers, but are changed in their properties, qualities, inclinations, whenever a new nature is given to them. So the waters at Marah were the same waters still before and after their cure. But of themselves and in their own nature they were bitter, so as that the people could not drink them. On the casting of a tree into them they were made sweet and useful, Exodus 15.25. So was it with the waters of Jericho, which were cured by casting salt into them. 2 Kings 2, verses 19-22. Our affections continue the same as they were in their nature, in essence, but they are so cured by grace as that their properties, qualities, and inclinations are all cleaned and renewed. The tree or salt that is cast into these waters in which the cure is wrought is the love of God above all proceeding from faith in him by Christ Jesus. This is the end of chapter 12 of the grace and duty of being spiritually minded by John Owen.